entity that, that can help uh, make high-performing workloads possible in the cloud. Um, we'll talk about some of the challenges that we faced and how we bravely overcame them um, and some future plans that, that uh, we still plan to uh, deliver on in, in the months and releases to come. Um, so as I said, most people here are pretty familiar with OpenStack, I assume. Is there anybody here who has no idea whatsoever what OpenStack is? I didn't think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go quickly through this. I basically wrote this myself, so you can't, this wasn't copy pasted from, the, from a website or something. So um, it's basically cloud infrastructure, whatever that means to people. It's open source and mostly written in Python. That number's made up, but it's like <laughs> mostly written in Python. Um, it, uh, it's kind of organized as multiple projects each of which has its own kind of like thing it's supposed to manage through uh, an API and potentially uh, uh, like a dashboard. So it, it, it pretends to be infrastructure as a service uh, solution. Um, so more about OpenStack Nova itself, which is the uh, compute part, which is probably what the next bullet point is going to say. So yeah, manage compute resources, so basically VMs that consume CPU and memory um, on, on your compute infrastructure through a, through a REST API. So it allows you to schedule or schedule uh, VMs uh, across your pool of, of hardware. Um, storage and networking is handled by different components, and I won't be talking about them here. Um, and it does, you know, allows you to start, stop, resize, and snapshot your VMs, and also allows administrators to do more advanced uh, tasks like migrate, live migrate. Um, and what's, I guess, maybe interesting uh, and it gets maybe a little bit forgotten in Red Hat is that it supports several different um, virtualization technologies, but um, we mostly talk about libvirt KVM, which is what most of the features, actually all of the features I'm going to be talking about in this talk uh, are uh, rely on. Um, so I guess a little bit of the uh, kind of like what the whole Elastic Cloud idea is about. And this is interesting with this talk because it kind of a little bit is at odds with some of the, uh, some of the requirements that, that are put in front of um, developers when they, wanna, when they wanna start caring about high performance and about proper utilization of or, or specific utilization of resources. So the idea is to allow for quick provisioning and of, of commodity hardware. And the, the way it's supposed to do this is that instead of allowing the user to, to consume resources, it presents them in a section called flavors, which is a, like a predefined combination of, of resources you want to use. And it allows only very simple, simple scheduling, which focuses on scale. So you don't, by like, in its simplest deployment scenario, it doesn't doesn't try to do anything optimal or smart. It tries to be fast and and simple. Like I said, other other um, stuff is handled by different projects, and we won't be going into them, although in the, they might be interesting in the, uh, in the big picture, but this talk is about mostly about what Nova lets you do. And I guess 
Uh, an important thing to, to emphasize, which I already said a couple of times, is that there is no visibility into the hardware their, their, their workloads are running on. So user is supposed to be completely oblivious to, to, the, uh, to, the, to what is actually um, the hardware they're running on. This is a, like a brief slide of, of the architecture. And like, I guess the important thing is that there's, there's an API that accepts requests. And then there's message queues. So most of the stuff is asynchronous. Um, the interesting thing here that's, that's, that I'm going to be talking about a little bit more in detail is the Nova scheduler and how, how that presented some challenges for us. And, um, and this is actually in the next, I guess, um, two slides. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically it. It's not too important for this talk to go into these details. But the, the general idea is, like I said, there's an API. And then it's synchronously dispatched to a queue where workers or actually scheduler decides where to place the VM. And then it gets done or fails, as the case may be, but mostly gets done right. Um, so I guess it's interesting if, if um, to maybe go a little bit into this and see how this fits with, with, uh, with the high performance requirements. There's flavors, uh, as I said, and they um, carry basic information about the resources that will be assigned to an instance. So it's, it's sometimes, in the simplest case, just the number of CPUs and the amount of RAM that, that or potentially disk that the VM will have. Um, it can be a bit more complicated than that. And uh, it can be overridden through image metadata, which is user controlled while the flavors are, uh, which is also an important thing that I guess forgot to, I forgot to mention, they're admin controlled. So admins would define them. And that's the only thing users would be able to, or the, the, the granularity at which the users would be able to consume resources. And yeah, the uh, scheduling is basically, there is no optimal placement. It just has a list of all the hosts, puts them through a set of filters that uh, admin can tune to, a, to, a, to an extent. And uh, any hosts that pass all the filters are considered. Uh, basically, filters are functions that return true or false for a, for a for any given host um, in your pool of compute hosts. Um, and this is um, most of the filters are written in uh, without going into specific devices or uh, resources without considering specific devices rather, or resources rather, considering how many of them are there and, uh, and uh, just grabbing whatever's there. And that's, that, that possesses a problem when you want to start thinking about how to actually assign a specific resource, like a specific CPU or, or PCI device uh, to, a, to a VM. So I guess what I try to say here is that the, the basic infrastructure and the framework that, that Nova provi provides does not, does not necessarily play well with trying to do <coughs> stuff that we try to do in order to give more guarantees to the users about, about performance of their VMs. So why, do, why should people care about? high performance. If they want high performance, they should probably use bare metal. That's kind of the, uh, what some people think and say. And, um, but as we all know, everything's moving to the cloud. So we have to adapt. Um, but there are some, some interesting, uh, I guess, use cases, all joking aside. 
And the famous one, I guess, or the, the poster child of this kind of stuff is NFB, where telco providers want to move a lot of their, their, I guess, packet processing into VMs. And that can be latency and performance sensitive. So um, that's kind of where, where the idea and the push came from. But there's also the, uh, the fact that there are modern hardware is NUMA capable, which is something you want to maybe start considering even for non-critical applications. And so when we started thinking about this, um, we, we, we realized um, that it's, we, have to, we have to find a way to, to expose or let users request certain high performance characteristics without actually allowing them to choose CPUs or specific devices because that's not, not, um, not something we really want to do or actually can easily do with the existing APIs and abstractions that Nova um, and OpenStack provide. And that was, that was I guess, the, uh, the kind of like the, the design problem we tried to solve um, solve um, when we started doing this. So the next couple of slides are going to be about specific features we added um, and specific like performance enhancing features we, and how we expose them through an API and um, how that works. So I'll, I'll try to explain how that's different from just saying I need three CPUs and hopefully or X amount of RAM, and hopefully that will um, be clear, because that's, that's kind of the, uh, the crux of this talk. So the first thing is, um, obviously, we wanna, wanted to make um, uh, Nova aware of the NUMA characteristics of, of the compute hosts, because um, this can help um, help with uh, memory access latency. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details here. But um, yeah, basically, if you're accessing memory that's not on your, on, on the NUMA node the, the code is running on, there's a, there's a penalty to accessing it. Or it takes longer to access that memory, which is obviously something we want to avoid as much as possible for performance sensitive workloads. We ne don't necessarily care about this, or maybe we don't need to care about this for, for um, cheaper VMs, but it's important for high performance workloads. And um, this is also interesting in combination with uh, dedicated IO devices. Yeah, so um, this is for um, the first time I gave this talk was at KVM Forum, so um, there was a little bit of uh, Livrit KVM stuff here. But um, Livrit will expose host capabilities, um, NUMA, I mean NUMA topology of the host. So first thing was to somehow take that and store this into Nova and start making placement decisions based on this. And so this is basically how we decided to expose this to the, uh, to the uh, user. So um, we would only allow users to actually admins to say that um, a node, uh, a VM can have a certain number of NUMA nodes. If you just say one, that's also a valid thing, but it still means that Nova will make sure that that VM is contained to a single NUMA node. Um, and then there are some additional options that I guess has limited usefulness, but the, it's there. And so the, I guess the interesting thing here, or something I would like to emphasize, is that there's no way for users to choose which NUMA nodes 
this goes to or something like that. It just says, I want this to end up confined to a NUMA node. Um, yeah. Um, so how is this done in Nova? As we've said, um, there is a way for, for compute hosts to, to uh, expose this information to the Nova scheduler. Um, request the topology is saved as well. And then once the, uh, once the instance is being, uh, is being scheduled and placed on a host, we would basically see if it based on the number of CPUs and the number of CPUs available on the, uh, on the NUMA node, um, see if it can fit there, and if not, uh, move on. So as you can see, this is different than placing VMs on hosts. We're basically placing them on, on um, NUMA nodes. And the fitting algorithm would fit it, uh, place it on a, any available NUMA node on the host. So there's no, there's no way to request a specific NUMA node, which is um, kind of different when you also want I.O. devices as well, like PCI devices, but we'll get to that. And then finally, since Libvirt driver is the uh, backend for Nova, is the only one that implements this, um, Libvirt does the work of, 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 um, of actually confining this. And this is do, done by the uh, vCPU pin element here. That's when you define the, uh, the domain in Libvirt. And as you can see, we basically confine a set of CPUs to, to a set of host CPUs. So as you can see here, we don't place them on single CPUs. We place them on the uh, set of CPUs. So in this case, um, uh, 0 and 1 would be the first NUMA node, I guess, of the, of the host. Um, this is also important for memory as well, not only CPUs. So this is, this is basically telling Libvirt to assign memory from a specific uh, node. So next thing we did is um, huge pages awareness. Um, oops. Yeah, this is also interesting because of um, performance. The, uh, I guess the, the, uh, the win here is that there is no, uh, if, if you don't have a lot of pages to keep track of, um, then uh, you, can, uh, you can cache uh, all the virtual to physical addresses in, in, a, in a constrained resource called the TLB, and if you can, so it makes, <coughs> makes um, I guess, makes you, you use the TLB uh, better, and that makes it, um, makes it perform better. And the idea, I don't know, um, these slides were done by a colleague of mine who actually did the work here, and um, there's as much as 15% improvements, and there's a, there's also a, a reference there, so I guess, um, sorry, that's the idea. There, um, so this is an example of, of how much more efficient it is if you have larger page size. So you basically need only one entry in the cache and you don't have to actually do all the walking of tables. Um, you just have a cache hit and you, you have your, your actual physical address. And uh, that's obviously way more efficient and important for workloads that care about that kind of stuff. Um, different architectures have different page sizes, um, but that's not necessarily important here other than, than, than knowing that we had to somehow expose this through the API in a smart way because you don't want to make assumptions uh, on what kind of hardware you're running on. So um, the API bits of this was setting, allowing the flavor, f 
flavor to just say uh, use large pages. What that means is, as we said, depending on the, uh, on the actual hardware. And uh, then we added some kind of um, any, which allowed us to, uh, to actually let users request it if the admin allows something like that, um, which I think is also slightly limited in its usefulness, but it's there. Um, I think um, what's interesting to mention here, and I probably mentioned, forgot to mention it earlier, is that this kind of brings in the fact that, I think it's maybe mentioned later, um, you have to set this on the host when you boot it. So it kind of breaks the promise that you can quickly provision any type of hardware. There's, there's now additional work, work that um, needs to be done, uh, there by the uh, sysadmins or, or operators of the system. But there has to be some kind of a trade-off. And we don't live in the perfect world. So this was deemed acceptable by uh, people. But it's worth mentioning as if this was one of the constraints of the design. And yeah, so huge pages are implemented on top of the uh, NUMA awareness, so they are per NUMA node. And there's even, even a, uh, we allow asymmetric allocation, which is apparently a feature people wanted. So um, yeah, so this version of Libvirt and above exposes huge pages or yeah um, exposes the uh, information about pages available in the host so um, same as before we can grab this from from all the compute hosts and and consider this when when uh, placing VMs and uh, yeah so this is the uh, how we how this is implemented. Uh, once we place the VM, this is how we request this from from Livert. Nova Livert driver generates this XML and passes it over to Livert. So CPU pinning is um, actually maybe not the best name for this because it's actually giving VMs dedicated CPUs. So as we said, normally you would let your VM use any available CPU, and this will be in the KVM case and Livert case up to the uh, OS scheduler to decide. But um, for obviously performance sensitive apps, you want to allow a VM to completely use a CPU. So that's um, that's um, that's one thing, and then there's hyperthreading comes into in, into uh, play here as well, which presented interesting problems. Um, and uh, because sometimes you wanna you wanna prefer being on the on the same same basically physical core because of better cache utilization. Sometimes you don't, and that's something also that's very tricky to. Uh, properly model in the uh, in the uh, world of resources that Nova knows about. So the problem and where this abstraction breaks a little bit, like with large pages, you want to have a separate set of hosts where you where you uh, place these VMs because mixing. Uh, workloads that don't care about performance and the ones that do is just something that we decided is a little bit tricky or an unnecess unnecessary complexity that we don't want to handle in the code. So we pass this off a little bit to the, uh, to the uh, system operators and tell them, if you want to provide this feature, you need to use uh, a feature of Nova that allows you to separate your hosts into what's called aggregates. So if you want to use this, you need to use this uh, in, in a, a, you know, in combination with saying m VMs that go on these hosts are only performance VMs and they will only be pinned to specific CPUs. 
And there is now obviously no overcommit in this case because this kind of defeats the uh, purpose of um, dedicated resources. And yeah, so kind of like the idea, maybe a subtlety here, is that it trades off the uh, maximizing hardware utilization to uh, to uh, to having high performance um, VMs, which is kind of like the more expensive VMs that people kind of expensive people want. Um, yeah, so we had. Again, a simple API that, that says we want to share their dedicated um, CPUs. Shared is the default. This is what Nova would do normally. Dedicated would have to be combined with request that says go to that specific set of costs. And then in that case, Nova would keep track of which CPUs are dedicated to which VMs and and uh, and allow you to make these guarantee you that the placement will be dedicated. Um, very similar to uh, the other parts of it, of the other features we implemented. This stuff is exposed, tracked by Nova. Placement decisions are made. Um, the placement algorithm currently is not super smart. It basically finds the first best fit, I think. It tries to be a little bit smart, so it will try to utilize the CPUs of different NUMA nodes uh, equally, but it doesn't do it in any kind of like globally optimal way. It just It's just in the way how we sort the available CPUs when we try to place VMs. Um, and so far, we haven't seen any problems or complaints from users with this. So, so far, it seems to work. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's basically, so far, it works. In theory, it's not very optimal because it goes through the uh, old permutations of possible NUMA nodes, which is uh, if you have a lot of NUMA nodes, it starts to get slow, I guess. But we're not there yet, so we'll fix it when we get there, maybe. Um, yeah, that's it. So this is the same as confining to a NUMA node, except you confine to a single CPU, basically giving the VM dedicated CPUs. And Nova tracking makes sure that you never share a CPU on that particular dedicated host. Um, so a third set of like an additional feature we added is also um, if you request a NUMA aware instance and you request a PCI pass-through device, it kind of doesn't really work for you unless the device is, uh, does I.O. on that same NUMA node. And uh, this was added as well. Uh, this was not, the work was not done by Red Hat, but it's a good example of how a couple of companies uh, collaborated on these kind of requirements. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically it. And the problem here is that you can't, the, like the takeaway here or the bug that we have is that you can't m match devices to NUMA nodes. So if you request a two NUMA node VM and you have two uh, PCI devices, they may end up on the same NUMA node. Uh, which may not be what you want. You want them to be on separate NUMA nodes, but there's no way to expose this. Um, yeah, so this is uh, what were the good parts. The good parts were that, um, at least in theory, but from what we hear from customers, this enabled OpenStack to be used by uh, a set of users that would not necessarily have a lot of use for it. And they all got involved with this in planning, some of them in development. And it was just generally a good thing for the community, um, as I so eloquently put it in the second bullet point. Uh, but there were some problems with this. 
um, there's, as, as we've seen with some, um, some of, the, uh, of the examples with large pages and, and CPU pinning, it does complicate uh, your, your operations because now you have to know which hosts are which and um, kind of breaks the promise that you just throw, throw hardware and, and scale out infinitely. And um, yeah, it's, as we've seen, tricky to expose these details in a, in a reasonable way, like for example, with the uh, NUMA nodes and PCI devices. Um, and there are some specific challenges with the uh, way this was implemented and done because it's not used by a big chunk of users, so it's off by default, which means it doesn't get all the testing we would like it to get. We're getting better at it, but it's just the reality of, of, of life. And the, uh, once we started doing this, a lot of the internals were not up to the, uh, were just not designed to ever, ever uh, handle these kind of, of requests as I tried to describe in the beginning. And this is where a lot of the development time was spent. And, um, but in the end, we all learned a lot. So or something, that's great. Um, so I, I kind of put this in future plans, but it's really a bug that, that uh, live migration won't work properly, so we should probably fix this. Is it a bug or a feature? You could probably take advantage of that. Uh, you have to maybe have it, well, no, well, yeah, um, it's a bug for just purely VMs that don't do any pass-through. So that's the, we should definitely support this um, properly. Currently, we don't do it properly. Sometimes it might work, sometimes it might not. So, um, and yeah, there's, there's some uh, features. Um, the uh, uh, threading features were actually merged not long ago, it's not released yet, but it's merged. And this was also done by engineers from different companies. So that built up on a lot of the work that Red Hat folks did. So this was definitely a good example of how this model worked well. And device pastor, as, I will, as I've spoken already. So with that, I will allow you to ask questions. There's three scarves here that I'm supposed to give to the best three questions. Um, but yeah, so give me at least three questions. <laughs> OK. Uh, two questions. <laughs> you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there is support for SRIOV. That's what I mean by PCI. Devices support the reason why I didn't. If possible, we use SRIOV for your Yes, in the general case. It doesn't have to be. You can pass through, for example, non SRIOV devices, but um, yeah, it's majority of users would probably use it with. There was a good reason, but I forgot. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I should have looked it up. This was, this work was done by done like a year ago now. So yeah, I, I kind of forgot about those details. Sorry about that. But thank you for asking. Come for your scarf if you want. No, y um, in theory it could be, but it's not. So if, as long as libvirt basically exposes this kind of information, which I think it does. The latency of the I don't know. But yeah, as long as libvirt can tell us about this in, in Nova land, we could probably do it, but we don't. Scarf. Actually, maybe there will be more questions, so let's see who gets the scarf now. <laughs> Well, 
Well, so it is. You can do this. I mean, as long as, like, Nova would allow you to say that these devices are uh, fair game. It's just not something we necessarily focused on and not something that the community focuses on because a lot of the c community members that work on this are also from the, uh, from the networking world. So it's, I, I, it's not tested, for example, That's that, or not heavily tested. But yeah, it's something that we, in theory, support. GPUs. And so right. So the question was: Does Nova allow for evacuation of these VMs? And that is a good question because uh, when you say evacuation, Nova has uses this word very liberally so it can mean a number of things but in the uh, in the simplest case it means that you know a node is down you because you shut it down because something was wrong with it and you want to start these VMs somewhere else uh, there's two ways to do this to tell Nova where to put it and to uh, let the scheduler decide again if you let the scheduler decide, it will work. If you tell it where to go, then it's not really tested. It should work, but I wouldn't. As, as if you're a customer, I wouldn't tell you, yeah, 100% use this. We would have to, have to test this, I think. Yeah. But as long as you let Nova decide, it will, do, it will do make, the, make, the, make the same decision when, that it did when placing the VM. So. OK, thanks a lot. If there are no more questions, three people who ask questions and one scarves can come and get them here, because all questions were amazing. <laughs> and yeah, logos. Before you leave, can you upload this presentation? That's, uh, or you have it on GitHub? or. I think I have some. I yeah. I can. I guess I can. Send me an email to my, my Red Hat email. And, uh, okay, this is just because the presentation will be available online. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. I will definitely send you the PDF version of it. Okay. Well, thank you. And you got a sticker for a speaker. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and a hoodie. And right, a scarf. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes scarves. No, they're not nice. Okay. <laughs> Have you had trouble giving them all away? I think it's because it's not cold. It's not that cold, true. Yeah. Yeah. If there were like minus 10 centigrade, it would be more popular, I guess. 
there last year it was snowing. Snow. Yeah, but probably people will have had that anyway before. You already got the sticker? Oh, okay. And the uh, presentation as well? Hmm? Presentation as well? Uh, he will send the presentation, he doesn't have it in the media. Oh, okay. Mm, it's not so but we can get you in the HTML. So it's not Thanks, dude. that works. Yes, that'll do. It's advertising itself as a widescreen display, but it isn't actually a widescreen display. So. I don't understand how well, I'm glad I came in early this morning because I noticed that it looked really crappy and I started to think about how to. Um, yeah, and I, know. I mean, they cost a fortune, right? Yeah, Even the bulbs cost, I, I think the bulbs are, you know, several hundred euros. I'm going to leave that up for human interest. No. Yeah, I'm going to take a picture of the room at the start of the presentation oh. and I'm going to try and incorporate it into a demo. Okay. So but if you like to schedule the site and we'll do it. I will I will explain this again in the talk, but it's basically it's difficult to demo what I'm talking about in a way that looks interesting at all because it's just waiting. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you see people like uh, Steph do cockpit demos and they look so cool. Yeah. And they then I'm like, hey, could you do a demo? I'm like I could, but you just you know, do you have you go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> That's all there is. So 